My name is Edwin Gaines. I live in Valleyhead, Alabama. I've been a Unity Minister now for 38 years. And I am a woman of power. I know who I am. And I know who you are. And I'm here today to share with you some ideas about how you can live a fuller life. Life is supposed to be good. I didn't know that for a lot of my younger days. And I did a lot of suffering. Living from paycheck to paycheck, working two jobs. Just getting by, putting up with, making ends meet. Never having anything left over any fun. But in 1976, I made a commitment with holes in my shoes that I would be 100% responsible for the transformation of the abundance consciousness of planet Earth. I did not know what I was talking about when I said that. I did not know where it would take me. If I had known, I probably wouldn't have said that. But I knew there was something in me that knew that we were loved beyond our capability of understanding that love. And that we are not here to suffer. We're not here to struggle. We're not here to just get by. We're here to live a joyous, abundant, rich life. Healthy, joyous relationships. Work that we love. And so I began my study. And I, I didn't really know where to go because I lived in a little East Texas town where there was no Unity Church, no New Thought conversation going on anywhere. And so I didn't have any money to buy books, but I would go to the library. And I would begin to read books on self-help. You know, there was a wonderful one by Maxwell Maltz called Psycho-Cybernetics. Fabulous book. And then I, I read uh, some Dale Carnegie, and I wanted to learn how to be a nicer person. And... Uh, that was hard, but <laughs> but then I began to, to fall into these books on prosperity. They had some Catherine Ponder books, which I love Catherine Ponder. What a light she's been for us. And they had one book by Charles Fillmore, and they had the book Prosperity. And I read that book. I mean, I read it word for word over and over, and it just went right over my head. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I knew it was true. Did you ever have that kind of a feeling? If I just keep working at this, I'll find it. But here's what I did. Now, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you this. But I, I would read all these books, and, and nearly every one of them had a chapter on tithing. And I would skip that one and go into the next. Because I couldn't do that, for God's sake. I mean, I could barely buy groceries, you know. And I would dig in the sofa for, for money to send my daughter to school for her lunch money and uh, so I just didn't pay attention to that and I do the other things you know what I begin to set some goals and I began to do a little forgiveness work not too much but a little bit and uh, I found some things started to work in a little bit I didn't have any big demonstrations and 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 I was struggling you know there was never enough and so um, I went back one day after I've been reading these books for about six months and I decided, I'm going to read these chapters on tithing. Yeah? And I would read them. And I would say, well, that's fine. I'm glad that worked for you. And just move right on through, you know? And then I decided I will look all the tithing scriptures up in the Bible. And I got me a concordance, checked it out, and looked up every single tithing scripture. And, uh, and I, you know, it started with uh, Abraham. Good for you, Abraham. Glad that worked. And on to Jacob and, you know, and all the patriarchs. And good, I'm so happy it worked. But not me. No, no. Besides, this is the Old Testament law. I knew that. And, and I, you know, at church, I was in the fundamentalist church at the time, I knew that preacher was yelling at us, and he was trying to get my money. He wasn't going to get it because I was smarter than he was. That's exactly how it felt. But nothing was uh, working the way I wanted it to work, and I knew it had to be a better way. And all these smart people were saying that you need to tie it. So here's what I did. Now, again, I'm not particularly proud of this, but... But I, here's what I did. I went into prayer. And I said, okay, God. Now, talk to God just when I'm talking to you. God, now look here. You know I'm scared to do this. And you know, but you promised me in, in the book of Malachi 
that if I bring my tithe into the storehouse, now the storehouse for me is where the food is kept. Spiritual food, where the spiritual food. If I bring my tithe into the storehouse, if I give where I'm fed spiritually, that the windows of heaven are going to open for me. You know, you, that's a promise. I read it over and over. You promised that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this tithing thing for six months. Now, if you can't prove yourself in my life in six months, I'm sorry, big fellow, that's all you got. I'm not going to fool myself about this. I've got a little notebook. I'm going to write it all down. Every penny that comes in, salary, bonus, garage sale money. My aunt Sally sends me birthday money. My dad gives me 20 bucks. If I find a dime on the sidewalk, I'm writing it down in my little book, and one-tenth of it is going out where I get my spiritual food. Now, the word tithe means a tenth. doesn't mean 3%. doesn't mean 7%. does not mean what's left over after you pay the bills. It's one-tenth off the top, given back on a regular and disciplined basis to that person, place, or institution where you receive your spiritual food. So I did that. I made a commitment to do it for six months. Oh, it was scary. You know, I would write my little check, and I'd go in the bathroom, I'd rave it in the mirror. Okay, God, now look here. See what I'm doing? Let's get these windows of heaven open. You promised me that, okay? And, and uh, the first three months, that I tithe, nothing much happened. Somehow we did eat. They didn't turn off my electricity. I did a lot of affirmations such as creditors can't eat me. Creditors can't eat me. At the end of three months, folks, my income was doubled. At the end of six months, my income had tripled. Well, that's all the agreement I had with God, but I wasn't going to stop there. I could tell something was happening here. At the end of my first year of acknowledging that God is my source with my tithe, I was receiving from the universe over $100,000 a year. Now, folks, this was 45 years ago. That was a whole lot more money then than it is now. At the end of that first year of tithing, I had two businesses. I did not know how to do business. God and I opened these businesses on a shoestring. I had a brand new home in the fanciest part of town, elegantly decorated. And a brand new white Cadillac convertible. Love that car. That car was as big as this room. I put the top down, rolled it around, and it felt like the Rose Bowl Queen. It was beautiful. And I got to see that there is a connection between our giving and our receiving. Poke your neighbor very gently, very gently. She's talking to you. And if you're not receiving enough, guess what? You're not giving enough. And I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your time and your energy and your talent and your skills. You, you, we have so much to give. Sometimes just a smile can change someone's life. You understand that? I know that you do. I know that's why you're here. And I've been tithing now for 40-something odd years. And where I am now is I live in Valley Head, Alabama. I have a beautiful retreat center called Rock Ridge Retreat. It's about almost 30 acres. It's uh, got a meeting room that seats 200, a chapel, a uh, firewalk site, a grotto to the Black Madonna, a prayer pyramid. It's a beautiful space. It's completely paid for. I have no debt of any kind. I travel first class. I've been everywhere in the world I've ever wanted to go. Now, this may not be your idea of prosperity, but what is your idea? Because whatever you want, you have a right to receive. Charles Fillmore says in his book, Prosperity, that desire is the onward impulse of the ever-evolving soul. And that's who we are, ever-evolving souls, evolving into the pure expression of our divinity. And the way we get there, according to Fillmore, is we follow our desires. Whatever it is that you want, God wants you to have. Because God is your source. And God provides. But we have to come into alignment with some spiritual rules. I wrote a book about this book. I have it in the back. If you get it or if you have it, I'd love to sign it for you. It's called The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity, A Simple Guide to Unlimited Abundance. And in that book, I outline my journey from real holes in my shoes, kind of poverty, to a level of living today that many would consider a life of great wealth. And I did so by coming into alignment with these four very simple rules. Number one, we've got to tithe. We've got to tithe in order to acknowledge that we know that God is my source. God is my source. Say it with me. God is my source. Easy to say. But the law requires an action. That action is that when you receive money, 
you come to realize that one-tenth of it belongs to God. And you give it back where you've been fed spiritually. Now, what is spiritual food? Spiritual food is that which causes us to remember who we are, wakes us up and shakes us up and gets us back on our spiritual pathway. That is spiritual food. Spiritual law number two. We're required to forgive everybody all the time, especially ourselves. How many of you know that you have some forgiveness work to do? It's time to do it. Let's see those hands. Wonderful. Here's a test to see if you have any forgiveness work left to do at all. Do you still have a body? (laughs) Pretty good giveaway right there. Now, I've done a lot of forgiveness work in my life, and I continue to work on it on a daily basis. And one of the things I've noticed about my own process is the only people that I ever have to forgive are those people who don't do things my way. And there seem to be a lot of them. And many of them drive in Birmingham, I'm just saying. (laughs) So one of my prayer techniques is every night before I go to sleep, I ask myself in prayer, have I put anyone outside my heart today? And usually I have. There's some poor soul out there that did not get Queen Edwin's edict about how to behave on planet Earth. So it's off with their heads. Mm. And so I have to spend time then forgiving myself for being so self-righteous and so judgmental. And then I have to forgive them for not understanding what my rules are. And then I always look and see, what was the situation? What was going on there? Folks, it's always the same issue for me. It's a control issue. I know how you ought to behave. Do you hear that? I'm working on it. Pray with me. Forgiveness is not something we do for them. It's something we do for us. And when you hold on to bitterness, when you hold on to the resentment or you have a grudge or, or if you're angry, if you're guilty or if you're full of shame, what you're doing is building a wall all the way around you as if you're building it out of those big, thick concrete blocks and the good that you desire and deserve cannot get in. And every time you forgive the least little thing, You open a way for more good to come into your life. Forgiveness is not something you do for them. You do it for yourself. Because when you do that, you signal the universe that you're ready to play with the big kids. You're ready to let go of childish things, to put away those childish things, and step into your own magnificence. Spiritual law number three, we're required to set clear-cut, tangible goals. What do you want? What exactly do you want? Jesus Christ said, ask and you shall receive. He did not say, make me guess. Most people treat their catalog order store better than they treat God. Can you imagine calling up Amazon or Neiman Marcus or J.C. Penney's and saying, hey, would y'all just send me something you think I'd like? Well, the computers would go nuts. When you order from a catalog store, you have to tell them the size, the page, the fabric, the color, the number, all sorts of specific details. And yet, we dare to go to God with these airy, very prayers and wonder why we get airy, very results. Catherine Ponder says, the more specific you are, the quicker you will have your demonstration. So you don't say, I want a new car. You say the make, the model, the color, the interior, all the details are important to you. You don't say, I want to go on vacation. You say where you want to go, what you want to see, how you want to travel, like that. The more specific you are, the quicker you will have your demonstration. In the workshop, we get a little goal-setting handout that gives you the steps to set clear-cut, tangible goals. A woman came to a workshop years ago, and she was filling out her form in the in the workshop, and she got home, and she's called me. She's crying. She's bawling. Oh, my God. Edwin, I did it wrong. I I wasn't specific enough. I just wrote down. I couldn't wait. I just wrote down on my gold sheet, I want more love in my life. And she's like, I got home. My neighbor brought me over a pregnant dog. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's not what she had in mind. But do you see that she got exactly what she asked for? So if you're not getting what you want when you set your goals, try being a little more specific. You see, this is a secret I want to tell you about goal setting. 
Goal setting is not about getting stuff. Goal setting is really about learning to make wise choices. So when you set a goal, you're either going to love it or you're not. It's no big deal. It's taking you somewhere you need to go, something you need to learn. So if you don't like it, it's no big deal. You prayed it in your life, pray it out. Works wonderful with relationships. <laughs> I'm just saying. Spiritual law number four. We're required to seek and find and get on our divine purpose. What are you here for? What is your mission? What is that great work that is uniquely yours? Emma Curtis Hopkins calls it your magnificent opus. What is that mighty work that you came to do? Because see, you are here on a mission. Whether you have awakened to it or not, or yet, you're here. There is something in you that calls to be that light of the world that you have come to be. And as we wake up and we get on purpose with our lives, we begin to find that what we do and say makes a difference. So, You'll get instructions today on how to do that, how to find your divine purpose, how to set those goals, how to do your forgiveness work on a daily basis, and how to begin to acknowledge that God is the source of your good. What happened for me during that first period of tithing? An interesting thing Mr. Fillmore says, and I put it to a test. In his book, Prosperity, he says, the moment that you begin to tithe, your faith is increased 100-fold. And that's what happened for me. Even though I was giving out more money than I'd ever given in my entire life, my faith grew. My faith grew to the point where I opened my first business with a $2.75 classified ad, grocery money. And my phone rang off the wall. And that's what enabled me to double my income in the first three months. There's something in you now is decided that you want to play in a larger level than you've ever played before. And the universe is going to begin to bring you opportunities to step outside your comfort zone and to play bigger. And your job is to go within and see, can I do this? And if you're afraid, that's okay. It's okay to be afraid. It's not okay to let fear paralyze you and keep you stuck. So I, I like to ask people, what guidance have you received lately that you have yet to act on? That you're postponing acting on? Something new has come up in my life I want to share with you. And I ask for your prayers because I've never done anything like this before. I'm leaving on Wednesday to go to New York City where I've been invited to do two stand-up comedy gigs at a New York City supper club. Please pray for me. Because those people are going to be drinking. <laughs> and I'm going to be talking to them about God. How can this work? You know? We'll see. If they don't throw tomatoes, I'm fine. That's all I require. Don't throw tomatoes. I want you to hear this part of the message that I briefly mentioned during the meditation. The Christmas story is a metaphor for the awakening of your holy self. Now, we all have an ego, and we need an ego. We need an informed ego. But the ego is not supposed to run the show. The ego is under the direction of the shining one in you. The scriptures call that Christ in you, your hope of glory. So I invite you to celebrate this Christmas season as the awakening of your own magnificence. And you're willing to step outside your comfort zone to play big. To let your light shine so brightly that others will see God in you. And seeing God in you, they will somehow know that God is in them and, them, in them, and they will honor that. They will wake up because they've been in your presence. The world needs us right now. Just listen to the television for an hour or two, and you can see that we need to shine light in places where the light hasn't shone for a while. We're not here to judge it. We're here to lift it up in prayer and know that every single one of us is getting exactly the right message that we need to get to do our part 
to make this a world that works for all people everywhere. I invite you to come to the workshop. It starts at 1 o'clock. There's no charge for it. It's offered to you on a love offering basis. I invite you, if you will, to go and call your friends, the ones you love, and invite them to be here with you. Because we're going to do some life-transforming work this afternoon. We're going to let go of the blocks and the barriers that we've erected, and, and we're going to step forth to do what we've come to do. Now, I know that some of you think that you have other plans. I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to change them. Let me close this morning with a teaching given to us by Patrick Overton. I think I've said it every time I've come here. I say it as much as I can. It feeds my soul. Mr. Overton writes, When you have come to the edge of all the light that you know, and you're about to step off into the darkness of the unknown, Faith is knowing that one of two things will happen. There'll be something solid to stand on, or you'll be taught how to fly. Flying lessons, 1 o'clock. Be there. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>